Good afternoon. Can everybody hear me? Nice. My name is Kevin Campbell. It's my pleasure to be uh, helping out and moderating this, this session this afternoon. Uh, first thing, what did everybody think of that video? Yes. Pretty amazing, huh? You know what? I think you do get access to that, but we'll, we'll talk to BMT Infonet. So I had an opportunity to see that two years ago, and it had the, the same impact, some tears, and just uh, being really proud to, to be here and be a part of this meeting and, and here with all you. So thanks for allowing me to be part of it. So as I said, I'll help to moderate this session the, uh, this afternoon. We will uh, we'll introduce our speaker, go through a presentation, uh, and there will be plenty of time for, for Q&A. So please let's hold the, the questions until after the presentation. We'll have plenty of time for Q&A. So it is my, uh, my pleasure to introduce Dr. David Sabsovitz. Not bad. Got it. First time. Wow. Yes. I did talk to him earlier and asked him how to pronounce it. I was going to I was going to say Sabsovitz. Uh, so David is a neuropsychologist and associate professor of neurology at the Medical College of Wisconsin, which I think we all know is in Milwaukee, not, not Madison, uh, where he serves as the director of Neuropsychology Brain Tumor Clinic, specializes in the evaluation and treatment of adults with neurological, behavioral, and developmental disorders, and current research, which is, is pertinent to, to this meeting here, is the effects of cancer treatment uh, on cognition. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. Savsevitz. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I love how they use a picture of me that makes me look like I'm 14. Um, you know, <laughs> I get enough stuff from my patients. You're not old enough to be a doctor. Um, <laughs> but again, uh, so, so first of all, thank you so much for having me here uh, doing this. Uh, it's always a um, uh, a great honor for me to come and, and talk to patients as opposed to the usual audiences of doctors and scientists and things like this. I, I actually enjoy this a lot more, i got to be honest with you. Um, so today I'm going to be uh, talking about a topic that uh, I have lots of interest in. Uh, I, I live this stuff clinically. I also have a lot of research interest in it. Um, and I'm going to be talking about the effects of cancer treatment on cognition and really what we can do about it. I think that's why most people are here. <laughs> um, so what I'd like to do is uh, briefly talk about and define some terms. You know, what is chemo brain? What kind of symptoms kind of go with this whole chemo brain term? Uh, I want to talk a little bit about what we know about it and what we don't know about it. And I'm going to you know, bring in some research uh, in on the, the BMT, the bone marrow transplant uh, literature. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about how we go about evaluating for chemo brain, and then I'll spend some time talking about, again, treatments and interventions, and then we'll do questions. So uh, just to start, I I'm going to be using this term cognition a lot, you know, throughout this talk. So let's go ahead and define it. Cognition basically refers to the way we think, the way we think about the world around us. And Lots of processes are involved in cognition. Uh, for example, our, uh, the ability to pay attention to something, the ability to remember things, memory, our ability to communicate and understand what other people are saying to us, language, uh, problem solving, multitasking, all of those terms fall under the, the, the umbrella term cognition. So that's what I mean by cognition as I, as I go through this lecture. Um, so this is not going to be a surprise to anybody here. Um, you know, cognitive changes and cognitive symptoms are pretty common uh, in the cancer population, and that's across different types of cancers and uh, across different types of cancer treatments. And if you look at the literature, you know, the, the reported rates are, you know, all over the place, but there are some studies that report up to 75% of patients with cancer undergoing treatment will report some cognitive concerns or changes in their thinking. That's a pretty big, pretty big number. Um, the severity of those symptoms vary from subtle to the point where you notice them, you might be annoyed by them or frustrated by them, but they don't limit you in any substantial way to more severe where they can affect your ability to work, they can affect your ability to do other things that you would do in your in your day-to-day -day activities. Um, and as far as, you know, how long they last, uh, you know, there's some indication that, you know, a subset of patients can experience these symptoms for quite some time. Now, uh, the term chemo brain refers specifically to cognitive changes resulting from chemotherapy. 
uh, you know, cancer treatments, anything from chemotherapy to radiation to other types of interventions, and they all potentially have cognitive side effects. So when I talk about chemo brain, it's really specific to chemotherapy. And the patients that I see that, that come in with, with this concern, they often describe it as, you know, I'm walking around in this haze. I'm walking around in a fog all the time. And I've heard that so many times. I think it truly captures kind of that feeling. So that's why I picked this picture to kind of help, you know, illustrate kind of what it's probably like to experience that. Um, so, I, you know, my patients report all sorts of, you know, cognitive concerns. You know, the common ones are forgetfulness. You know, for example, you know, I, I'll have conversations with people and either I'll forget the conversation or I won't remember all the details. Uh, or, you know, I'm forgetting dates, appointments, mixing up times. I'm losing things. You know, that's the kind of stuff that, that you hear quite often. Uh, problems with multitasking are reported a lot. So, you know, I, I only could do one thing at a time. And if there's other things going on around me, forget about it, you know. Um, Feeling slower, you know, uh, so I, I hear a lot of the time, it just takes me longer to kind of grasp things. It takes me longer to kind of do things. Word finding problems, that's another real big one. So it's that, that annoying tip of the tongue kind of thing, you know, when you're talking and you get to a word and you're like, oh, what's that word? Oh, it's that, that thing that, you know, you, and then someone inevitably finishes your sentence for you. So that, that's another thing that we see all the time. And you can also, you know, see changes in planning and problem solving and, and organization as well. So these are some of the common cognitive symptoms that, you know, I see in my clinical work. So what do we know about uh, chemo brain? You know, most of the literature on this topic has been done in breast cancer patients. Um, and it's been going on over the last, you know, few decades. Uh, and, you know, I'm not going to bore you with numbers and statistics and references, but, you know, I think the take-home points from the literature is that um, it's common. Uh, we can see it anywhere from 17 to 35 percent of breast cancer patients that are studied, and there are some rates that go higher than that. Uh, fortunately, the changes tend to be more on the mild side in this population. What I mean by that is that we're not talking about and using terms like dementia. You know, these are you know problems again that are noticed. They're prob they're annoying, they're frustrating to a patient, but you know usually they're not debilitating. Um, there's also data that suggests that the further you move out from treatment, the better you get. So the vast majority of patients show some improvement, uh, you know, by about a year out and some even further after that. So that's some of the main take-home points with the breast cancer population. But what about bone marrow transplant population? So there's a lot less research looking at this population, but, um, you know, bone marrow is a little bit different because the preparation for bone marrow transplant tends to involve higher dose, more intense chemotherapy, and in some cases, whole body, including brain radiation. So the potential for that treatment to be neurotoxic, you know, is high. Um, so um, although there are a few studies, there, are, there is some data out, and I'm going to try to summarize that for you. It's a busy slide, but the main take-home points from this slide is that, you know, again, um, there's, there's a number of studies that have documented changes in thinking from before to after bone marrow transplant, but there's also some that don't show that. So there's a little bit of mixed findings, which I always find very interesting. You know, it makes me think a little bit about what are those individual factors that you bring to the table that might, you know, change outcome after treatment, you know. Um, there's also some, you know, mixed data about recovery afterwards. Some studies show that it can stay, you know, and persist for a while, while others show some really good recovery by about a year out. And some of the longer-term follow-ups, you know, again, you know, there's some data that shows that you can see some of it persist, and in other studies that it gets better. So if I were to summarize, you know, the limited research, it's kind of variable. It's mixed, you know. Um, so there's a lot of interest in, in the field in trying to understand what causes chemo brain. We don't know. That's the answer to that question. Uh, there are some mechanisms that have been identified and that are being studied. Uh, so, for example, um, you know, it's now known that chemotherapy can enter the brain. In the past, you know, it was argued chemotherapy doesn't get into the brain. You know, it stays systemically in our body and really doesn't get in the brain. So if it can't get into the brain, how does it damage the brain? Well, you know, there's animal studies uh, that, that have clearly shown that chemotherapy can enter the brain. And, you know, uh, we're not talking about just little amounts. Um, and if it enters the brain, you know, there's some different ideas that it can damage cells in our brain. It can damage the DNA in those cells. Everybody has heard the term DNA. It's essentially the computer program or code in each cell that tells it what to do and how to function and things like that. Um, 
There are certain um, research projects going on that are focusing more on what's called an inflammatory response. So chemotherapy can activate an inflammatory response within the body, and uh, there's some data to suggest that what goes in the body can also affect what goes on in the brain. So they kind of talk to each other. Um, there's a lot of interest in genetics. Uh, so again, you know, why is it that if you take two patients and they have the same treatment, they may look very different after the treatment as far as their outcome or the side effects they experience. So there are certain genes that we have that repair damage to our brain cells. And uh, there's some interest in better understanding those you know, genes as a mechanism for the outcomes that we see. So you know, we don't know what the cause is. There's research going on right now. And um, you know, hopefully, we'll, we'll get more answers as we move forward. Um, you know, in, in the clinical work that I do, um, you know, I see a lot of patients that uh, are being treated or have been treated for cancer, and sometimes it's not actually damage to the brain from the chemotherapy that explains the symptoms. And there are other things that we have to consider, we have to, you know, evaluate because we would treat those other things differently, okay? So this is a list of some other things that occur somewhat prominently in the cancer population that can also affect our thinking. So for example, um, you know, there are higher rates of stress. Uh, there's higher rates of depression and anxiety in patients diagnosed with cancer and going through treatment. Um, and we know that changes in mood and stress, especially at that level, can affect our thinking. I mean, just think back to time in your life where you felt extremely stressed. You know, how hard was it to focus? How hard was it to, you know, do those other cognitive activities? Um, you can see some, you know, medical complications uh, like anemia, which causes really bad fatigue, which in turn can affect thinking, and that can be addressed medically. Uh, infections and things like that are other things that, you know, we want to make sure aren't the culprit causing those cognitive changes. Uh, fatigue is a big thing. Um, it's pretty common uh, in, in cancer patients and can have some pretty significant effects on thinking as well. I have a sleep disturbance up there. That's another thing to take into consideration, uh, as sleep is very important for healthy brain functioning. And uh, if there's an underlying sleep issue, whether it preexisted the cancer or secondary to the cancer and treatments, again, that is a treatable thing, um, and so on on this list. So these are just the other things that um, can also be contributing to some of the cognitive symptoms we see in our, in our cancer patients. So um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, you know, how we go about evaluating for chemo brain. Um, show of hands, and you don't have to raise your hand if you're uncomfortable. Has anybody had a neuropsychological evaluation in this audience? Okay, very few people. So um, you know, basically what, what, what I do is I, I tell my patients that are concerned about their thinking to first talk to your doctor. All right, let's make sure all the lab tests are ordered and everything else that, that, you know, could rule out reversible things or medical reasons for your cognitive symptoms. And, you know, once we cross all that off, then it's time to consider what's called a neuropsychological evaluation. And before I tell you a lot about what that is, um, a lot of times they get asked the question, well, why can't I just go in for a brain scan? Why do I need to go through hours of testing? And the best way that I explain it is you have to think of a brain scan. I mean, imagine you're buying a used car, right? You lift up the hood, you look at the engine, and you see what the engine looks like, okay? Brain scans show us what things look like. But unless you test drive that thing, you're not going to know how it's functioning, and that's where cognitive testing and neuropsychological testing comes in, okay? We are test driving your brain. So what is a neuropsychological evaluation? Well, they often start with a clinical interview. And uh, you know, I always say that to my students that I train, your interview is just as important as your test data. And that's where you learn about the patient. Okay? Um, and during that interview, uh, it's important to uh, you know, get a lot of information about what type of cognitive symptoms you're experiencing, when did they start, you know, what's the course been like, okay? because that's important in trying to better understand what's causing it. Um, you know, we obviously want to review uh, for any potential emotional issues that need to be treated and things like that. So the clinical interview is really the time for the doctor to get to know you and get to know your problems before they start putting together all the tests for you to do. So after that's done, um, then comes the testing part. Uh, and I always tell my patients, it's like a day in school. You're going to be doing a lot of paper and pencil tests, a lot of question and answer tests, puzzles and things like that. We're not going to stick you with needles. We're not going to do anything painful. Um, and each test that we give looks at a different function of the brain, looks at a different part of the brain, a different circuit of the brain. So we're essentially test driving the brain and developing a profile of strengths and weaknesses, areas to treat, you know, and things like that. And we test all sorts of functions. You can see a list here from attention to memory to the speed of thinking. 
Um, the term executive functions refers to, just imagine like what an executive of a company would do, higher level reasoning, problem solving, multitasking, things like that. So the way we do these tests, uh, here's some examples. Um, you know, again, they're paper, pencil, question and answer type things. Um, you know, this is an example uh, of a, a spatial task we do where a patient's given blocks that have different colors on the different sides of the block and they're shown a picture and they have to put the blocks together to look just like the picture. Okay, and that looks at spatial, perceptual type functions. Uh, this is a, a very easy example of a reasoning task. So you're shown a pattern with a, a box that's uh, empty, and you have to pick which one down below would go up here to finish that pattern. Anybody want to guess? <laughs> All right. So, um, you know, again, this is a sample item. Those, the, the questions do get uh, harder, obviously. Um, you know, when it comes to testing speed of thinking, you know, we use very simple tasks. You know, but the, the, the key thing we're looking at is how quickly can you do those simple tasks. So this is a test where you have a key that you're allowed to look at the whole time, and then you have to fill in the empty boxes with the symbols that go with each of those numbers. And you have to do that very quickly, okay? And that's a processing speed task. Language, there's all sorts of ways we measure language, you know. Uh, there's word-finding tasks where you have to name pictures, or in a test like this, you have to pick which one down below is, uh, best goes with the one above, okay? Um, this is another problem solving task and then we also test things like motor functioning and things like that so you're putting pegs in a pegboard they're little keys into little keyholes and we look at how quickly you can do it so this gives you an idea of the type of um, neuropsychological or psychometric tests that we have in our clinic that we do with our patients um, I'm gonna go back because uh, I forgot to bring up on a point uh, and that is that what we do is we compare how you do to other people like you uh, often we don't have the um, uh, the the uh, we, we don't have the ability to test you before you know you, your cancer before you had your treatments because you weren't concerned about your thinking and your doctors never thought of sending you to someone like me. So you know the first time I'm meeting you is after you've had your treatment and now you have these concerns. So the way we try to see whether or not you're having any problems or not is again we compare it to large samples of normal individuals that are similar in age and education and other different demographic characteristics. Okay, and there's other things that go into that, but that's you know what we do with our test data. I'm a big proponent of getting testing done before treatment. Uh, it increases the sensitivity of of seeing if there are changes. It allows us to catch changes much earlier. Um, so at my hospital, I'm working a lot with my physicians to start doing cognitive screens in, in a lot of our cancer patients before they start their treatments. The other reason for doing that, sorry, I digress, is that there's a lot of data out there now showing that. Um, you know, a third, if not more, patients will have some cognitive issues even before they start treatment. So somehow the cancer can affect the brain itself. So again, another reason why to try to take a snapshot of brain functioning before treatment. Um, and then when we're done with the testing, we meet with our patients and we do feedback. And that's the opportunity to educate, to go over the results, and set up the game plan for what to do next. Which is a segue in what to do next. <laughs> so. Um, the treatment of chemo brain symptoms is largely dependent on the weaknesses that we find in our testing and the kind of symptoms you're experiencing. We don't treat two patients alike. Um, we can break down the type of interventions into broad categories. So one of the approaches is what's called behavioral and compensatory strategies. These are things that we can teach you or a therapist can teach you to try to minimize the impact of your cognitive symptoms on your day-to-day -day life. I call them like workarounds, you know, and we're going to go through some examples of that. And you guys probably have your own. I'd love to hear them if, if we have time at the end. Uh, there's also something called cognitive rehabilitation therapy, and that's where you meet with a therapist and you do drills and exercises to improve areas of weakness, and they also teach you the compensatory strategies and practice those, you know, within those sessions. And then there are medication options, which we'll talk about as well. So let's, um, uh, let's jump into uh, talking about some of these uh, compensatory strategies. Let's start with memory. That's probably one of the more common things we hear from our patients, concerns about memory. So, you know, I always tell my patients that, you know, there's a number of things you can do. For example, repetition is really important. So when you're learning information, the more you're exposed to it, the more you're doing with it, the better you're going to be at remembering it. So, you know, something as simple as repeating back information that you're hearing can help a lot in remembering that information. Um, if you're learning visual information, again, working with it a little bit over time, repetition. Um, try to increase the relevance of what you're learning. The more relevant it is, the uh, easier it's going to be to put into your memory. 
Um, so, you know, trying to rephrase things in your own words or adding certain, you know, uh, um, things that are personal to you to the information can help with that. Um, you know, there are things called mnemonic strategies. I'm not sure if you've heard of that, but um, some people use them, like forming associations between things. So I have people that come in and say, you know, I meet people and I just can't remember their name. So I say, well, let's try some things. You know, we'll take the first letter of their name and then, you know, relate that to a certain attribute or physical feature of that person or something that's salient. So, you know, Gail, G, green glasses. Gee, you know, so things like that can help prompt or prime your memory when you see them. And you can get very creative uh, with these type of things. Um, and there's other mnemonic strategies as well, like visual imagery. So trying to form visual images of verbal concepts and things like that. And uh, these are things, again, you can practice within the context of, a cog of cognitive rehabilitation therapy, or there's lots of good books out there, too, uh, that, that talk about these strategies. I'm a big fan of using uh, external uh, aids like notes and to-do lists and things like that. But <laughs> I love this slide. This is the section I call the good, the bad, and the ugly because there's a good way and a bad way of doing these things. And you can actually sabotage yourself by doing them in a certain way. Yeah, I, I see there's some Post-it fans in this audience. Um, so, you know, this is, a, this is sort of a, a, an extreme example of where it can really backfire. You know, where you have Post-it notes everywhere. You have, you know, a hundred different lists. You're losing your lists. You can't find your notes, you know. So, so some patients come in and they say, well, Doc, I'm doing all this stuff. And when we talk about it, we learn more that you are, but let's, let's tweak this a little bit, okay? So, um, you know, one of the things that I encourage my patients to do is, you know, avoid the multiple list thing. Avoid the hundred post-its. Let's bring it all together in a central location. And, you know, technology can be our friend. Uh, you know, I, I have up here, you know, pictures of, well, I don't even think they make these anymore, right? Are these the, the Blackberry things? I think they're gone, right? Um, but, you know, uh, with smartphones and tablets now, you know, it's a great resource because everything is in this small device you can carry with you everywhere. So they have calendars that you put your stuff in there. You set up reminders, you know, hey, I want to be reminded three days before this. Or I want this to remind me a week before my bills do so I don't forget. Uh, they have to-do lists that send reminders. It beeps. It talks to you, things like that. Um, there are apps where... I use this with my wife. Um, we each have the app, and for the grocery list part of it, when I put items on it, it immediately shows up on her phone. And when she puts items, it immediately shows up on mine. So, you know, I'll be walking around the grocery store thinking I'm done, and three more items pop up. But you can sync with your spouse or your partner and kind of help each other. Um, and the other thing, too, about technology is that, you know, you can talk to these things. This thing always, you know, amazes me. You can hit a button and say, Siri, remind me in three days to do this. And I'll say, okay. And it talks to you in three days. So again, using technology, embracing technology, trying to centralize all of these strategies can, can be very helpful as opposed to something like this where it's everywhere. Um, if you hate technology or scared of technology, then we go old school. You know, we buy day planners from Office Max, you know, where it's 15 minute intervals. Hey, I'm a big fan of that. Uh, or, you know, we have to, we can create to do lists and things like this. And the key again is put it all in the same notebook. You know, don't have it everywhere. Make that your book you carry with you everywhere. Get into a habit of checking it regularly, you know, and that can work for you as well. Um, I'm going to go through some individual complaints that I might hear and what we might suggest. So medications. So I have some patients that say, I'm forgetting my medications all the time. Um, so look, pill boxes. I bet all of you or many of you are probably already using that. Um, there are moments where I get up in the morning and I take my blood pressure pill and 40 minutes later, after getting the kids ready for school, I'm thinking, did I take my pill? You know, uh, it probably happens to a lot of us. You know, a pill box is great because you look in it and it tells you whether the pill's there or not. And if you have a spouse or a partner or whatever that's helping you with that, they can tell how compliant you're keeping with your medications and whether there's problems and whether you might need a little bit of help. You can use alarms with the medication box. Uh, I have some patients that um, go to meetings uh, or have conversations and they're forgetting details. So um, one thing I recommend is consider buying one of those little uh, cassette recorders. They make them the size of a piece of bubble gum. Um, and you obviously want to ask permission if you can tape things, but you know that's a great way that you don't have to remember everything in the moment and you can go back and review it later. The other thing I love about this is that how many people have been in their car and you think of something important that you need to do and then you forget by the time you stop and get out of your car. Okay. 
well, it's pretty easy if you got this little gum stick thing and you just say, okay, remember to da-da-da, and you set up in your day a time to review all of those things you record. You're not going to forget things in the moment. Again, these are workarounds, you know. Um, I have patients that are losing things all the time, and that's where I talk about the importance of structure and being regular. So, you know, you lose your keys in your wallet or your cell phone, no problem. We're going to hang up a key rack right by the door you come in and out of, and every time you walk in the house, you're going to hang your keys there and no place else. And when you leave the house, it's always going to be there, and you can apply that to certain things. You know, you're losing your remote control, pick a spot. You know, put a little thing where you can put your wallet in. Um, I have some patients that can't find their car in parking lots, uh, so I encourage them park in the same quadrant of the parking lot, divide it into quadrants, and you're always going to park in the northeast side, you know, uh, or hang a ribbon on your um, antenna to help you find your car from the other cars. Uh, there are apps as well for phones and that can actually find your car via GPS. Uh, patient, some patients forget to take things with them when they leave the house. And what I say is, in the moment, not later, but when you say, oh, I got to mail this letter, I got to mail my Mother's Day card, don't put it on the counter and think you're going to remember it later. Grab that at that moment and put it by the door you leave your house as a visual reminder. Dry cleaning, anything, you know, uh, work materials. I do that all the time. Uh, same thing with bills, you know, have an area where you keep all of your bills, you can organize them by the due date, you know, and that can help a little bit as a visual reminder if it's in plain view. So these are, again, some different strategies. What about attention? You know, uh, we get a lot of complaints about I just can't stay focused and things like that. So, you know, behaviorally, there's a few things you can do. Multita we all like to brag, we're multitaskers, we're great multitaskers, you know. There's literature that basically shows you don't want to be multitasking, you know. You, can be, you, you do better when you focus on a single task. Uh, so really trying to control that, control what else you're working on at the time and focus on one task at a time. Um, be an active participant in conversations. It's so easy to zone out during conversations if you have any kind of attentional problems. I'm not talking about selective hearing, guys. Um, but, uh, you know, but, but what I do is, and I do it, and I have my patients do it, repeat things back. Stop the conversation and say, okay, I just want to make sure we're on the same page. I'm hearing, or is this right? People aren't going to think anything about that. Uh, try to minimize distractions. Control your environment. I'm going to show you a slide next that shows how clutter can be the worst nightmare for attention. Um, uh, taking breaks is really important if you have any attentional stuff. You have a certain stamina, you know, and that stamina, you know, is going to, you're going to need those breaks. So what I have my patients do is journal for a couple days, do an experiment, you know, write down how long you're in an activity before you start going off task, how long until you start drifting, and then take a break. Start with a five-minute break and see, does that do it? After a five-minute break, can I get back on task easily and do another 40 minutes? Play with the intervals of when you're doing the task and how much break you need to optimize your attention. And that's what I encourage my patients to do. Uh, varying the kind of work you do. You know, variety can really help keep attention engaged. That's another thing. Um, this one is kind of, um, it's a fun, funny thing to do. Uh, and it's kind of, uh, it's referred to as self-talk. You know, how many people here have thought that they needed to do something, by the time they get to the room, they've forgotten what they wanted to do? <laughs> all of us, all right? So, um, you know, one strategy that I work, that, that we'll try with my patients is self-talk. So what I'll say is, okay, when you think of what you need to do, start either talking to yourself or talking out loud. Doesn't mean you're crazy, I promise. And just keep repeating it until you get to that point where you're doing that task. So, okay, I need to go downstairs and remember to mail this letter. I need to go downstairs and remember to grab this letter. I'm going downstairs to mail this letter. You know, it's, it's silly, but you know what? you're going to get downstairs and remember to mail the letter. <laughs> so again, a workaround. It's a compensatory strategy. Um, I put exercise down here because there's a lot of literature that shows that um, you know, regular exercise, physician-approved exercise, can maximize or optimize attention. All right? And that's research that's done in cancer patients. I'm not saying you, know, you need to be at the gym every day, but just a little bit of walking or speed walking or whatever you can do can go a long way. This is my slide about clutter. <laughs> so um, again, clutter is, you know, attention's worst nightmare. And the reason is, is that you don't know this, but your brain is processing everything that's happening around you, whether you want to or not. Okay. Now it has a great ability to ignore most of the things around you, 
But if you have an environment that has a lot of visual clutter, some of those attentional resources are going to be diverted to that, and that's less attentional resources to do what you're doing. So taking some time to reorganize your environment and control clutter can go a long way as well. Uh, you know, I've had some uh, you know, people that work, and they face very high clutter. Uh, high traffic -y areas, so we, we you know, encourage them to face away, or if you need quiet, wearing earplugs or uh, noise cancellation headphones can help. Uh, so those are, again, some workarounds. They take time, they take practice. You have to make it a part of your life and who you are for them to work. You can't just dabble in it, you know, because you know, you're not going to really benefit. You have to really integrate it into your routine. Uh, I mentioned cognitive rehabilitation therapy. So when I have some patients where, you know, they can't really get those strategies going on their own, we'll send them to one of our therapists who, you know, they, they, they work on drills and exercises to improve attention and memory. They work on those compensatory strategies with problems that you actually have in your real life. And there's data now that show that in cancer patients, there's some clinical trials that this can be effective in reducing cognitive symptoms. I know I'm going over a little bit. I only have a few slides left, okay. Uh, lifestyle changes, this is pretty common sense stuff to everybody here. Um, you know, I, I will emphasize sleep uh, because any kind of sleep disturbance can magnify any underlying cognitive symptoms. So, you know, whether it's sleep apnea or other sleep disturbance, um, you know, we want to get that addressed. Um, I don't think anyone's doing recreational drugs in here, but uh, not good for the brain, not good for thinking. Um, <laughs> You know, emotional factors, you know, I, I can't emphasize the importance of this. Um, you know, we, we don't want to minimize it. You know, we, we have to accept that there is a lot of stress and sometimes we can have mood changes, you know, when we're dealing with cancer. It's, it's, it's a huge battle that, that you're facing or have faced. And, um, you know, it doesn't mean weakness. I work a lot with my patients to destigmatize this, you know, because, like, I'm not depressed, you know. And as I interview them, I'm like, you're depressed. We need to talk about this, you know. And it's, and it's okay to be depressed, I, you know. So, you know, there's very effective treatments for, for depression and anxiety and stress. You know, I'm not talking about medications. I'm talking about effective therapies, uh, talk therapies out there. And then there are medication options as well. Uh, so just something to think about. I get asked this question all the time about brain games. So I put a slide in about this. Do I need to be doing brain games? I saw this ad on, on, online that if I sign up for 500 bucks, I get six weeks of this, and they're promising me I'm going to be this much better. So what I tell my patients is um, the following, that it's less important what you're doing than how much you're doing it, okay? So there's not a magical brain game out there. Reading is a great way to keep mentally stimulated. Book clubs, playing cards, things like that, you know? Um, so, you know, again, it's more important that you're doing it, not exactly what you're doing. And I'm, I always caution people that be careful with those huge promises and those expensive programs because what they sometimes do is you'll do the same task over and over and over again while you're doing this kind of training and then at the end they're going to show you, look, you got better. That happens. You're going to get better. It's called practice effect. But what we do know is that it doesn't generalize to your everyday life. You know, doing better on a computer task where you're pressing a button every time a letter pops up doesn't generalize to how you're going to do with driving or paying your bills on time. So you want to be careful about that stuff. But there is some, you know, relatively cheap and free internet stuff that, um, you know, if you find that fun and you find that stimulating, by all means do it. But keep your brain active. It's important for neurodegenerative conditions like Alzheimer's. It's important for, you know, across the spectrum of neurologic conditions. And it can be protective as well. Um, just a brief mention about medications, and then I'll wrap it up. Um, there's no magic pill for chemo brain. There's no FDA-approved drug for it. Um, but there are some medications that can be effective in some patients. Uh, one of the medication classes that... Um, you know, we use at our hospital, uh, you know, if the right symptoms are present, are stimulants. So what I'm referring to are drugs that are used to treat attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, your Ritalins, your Concertas, your Focalin, things like that. Stimulants help with attention, and attention problems are not uncommon in cancer patients or, or you know, in, from treatment. Um, the other thing it does a really good job at doing is helping with some of the fatigue that cancer patients experience. So you can kind of kill two birds with one stone in some situations and can be very effective. So we've had some, some good luck in some of our patients with, with using these kind of medications. And, yeah, they have side effects, so it has to be a decision you make with your physician. Um, 
you know, whenever there's mood issues, uh, we obviously treat that differently. You know, we talked about psychotherapy, but there are also medications that can be effective. If there's sleep disturbance, meeting with a sleep doctor to talk about what options there are to potentially treat that uh, medication-wise. And the last one I put in, um, you know, it doesn't apply so much to BMT population. It's that there's a clinical trial in brain tumor patients that, um, you know, had brain tumors, received radiation to the brain, and they uh, did a clinical trial with Aricept, which, as you might know, is a medication for Alzheimer's. And it, um, you know, basically um, prevents the breakdown of certain chemicals that are important for memory. And what they found was a small, uh, modest improvement uh, in those patients that were on Aricep compared to those that were not. And it was a well-done study. So, you know, I don't know if this really generalizes to other populations. I rarely will push or recommend this in my breast cancer patients, you know, my lung patients or my BMT patients. It's more really for the brain tumors that every now and then we might think about it. But, you know, these are just some medication options. So here's my hope. My hope is that, you know, with education, both of physicians and patients, because a lot of physicians don't even talk about this stuff, okay, with, with some education, uh, with some of these interventions that I listed here, uh, we can go from sort of this fog uh, feeling to more of a clear picture as far as the cognitive symptoms are concerned. So that's all I got for you guys. Uh, I would love some questions. So folks, let's do this. We have plenty of time for questions. I'm going to be a stickler about using the mic since this is all being recorded. So please go to the mic or if you're inside an aisle, we can, we can bring the mic around. And maybe just introduce yourself real quick and, and fire away. Okay, I'm Bob Moyer. I uh, had a stem cell transplant uh, 17 years ago. Um, my, <laughs> my question is, especially in multiple myeloma, you have an a elderly population. And how do you distinguish chemo brain from the normal <laughs> medical uh, age uh, deterioration? That was Wyoming, because I have to think about the state when I answer this question. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, that's a great question. So if you think back to that slide where I was talking about what we do with our neuropsychological data, we, we compare it to normative samples. So. Um, uh, you know, if we don't have the ability to see you before your treatment, that's what we do. So I, what was your name, Bob? Yeah. Bob, I'll compare your performance to, let's say, 700 people of your age and education, maybe ethnicity, whatever, and I should, you know, it gives me an idea of where you should be for your age. And if you're not following that trajectory and you're way off, then that could be an indication that it's something more than normal aging. And that's when then clinical skills have to come into play. We have to look at those scores and say, well, you know, we look for patterns. We look for things that tell us about how the brain is functioning and what circuits might not be functioning well. So um, I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Yeah, if you, uh, if you can use the mic, great. If not, I can repeat the question for you. We can bring it over to you. Yeah, bring, okay. We'll bring it over to you. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Are there any um, aspects of the human physiology that are not affected by chemo? <laughs> uh, that's a I mean, big question. <laughs> so, like, uh, Here, for instance, vision. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. The optic mm -hmm. nerve might be affected. Uh -huh. Hearing. The, yep. you know, the little cells in your ear, yep. the follicles, yeah. could be affected, so your hearing may mm -hmm. diminish. Mm -hmm. There's yeah, it's so a good many question. Things yeah. there that could sure. be affected by the toxicity. Yeah, you know, what complicates answering that question is that there's so many chemo drugs out there, and some chemo drugs have different side effect profiles than others. So, some, for example, are notorious for causing neuropathies, you know, loss of sensation, the tingling, numbness that you can get in your extremities. Others, um, yeah, can affect hearing uh, and things like that. So, you know, is there any, I'll rephrase your question, is there any brain function or brain physiology that's not affected by chemo? We don't know. We don't even know, again, what the underlying mechanism is of chemotherapy, and we're trying to understand that. So um, good question. I, there's not a clear answer to that. You know, what I can tell you is this, is that um, you know, with most chemotherapies, again, the, the cognitive changes we see are, tend to be more on the mild side. We're not seeing like complete loss of memory where you can't remember anything. We're not seeing the complete inability to make decisions. You know? So you know, it's a continuum of severity we can see. You know? Uh, so there are cognitive functions in my patients that are completely spared, and there's others that tend to be a little more affected. Did I answer your question? I'm, I mean, there isn't an answer is kind of what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, 
The answer, the answer, the answer is, uh, I, I don't mind this. I like this. The answer is no, and it depends, I think, on the drugs that you're getting, because they all have very, they can all have very different side effect profiles. No. And the combination of the drugs. So, yes. What would you suggest saying to instructors or educators that don't understand this problem? Because I've had a problem with one of my instructors, and I've explained like this problem of memory loss and like mm -hmm. difficulty remembering things, and he just doesn't understand it. Okay. Um, what would you suggest saying to him? Are you, uh, sorry, are you referring to like you're in school or you're yes, talking about school. physicians you work with? Oh, okay. Not All physicians, right, sure. like instructors, like teachers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, because you're right that th this whole idea of chemo brain is, um, number one, not widely um, you know, known about, and two, it's not widely accepted. That's the other thing we didn't even talk about today. I mean, there's a lot of controversy about chemo brain, you know, as far as is it real, is it not, is it just depression, stuff like that. So... You know, to answer your question, um, you know, the, the best thing you can do is you try to educate. And there's a lot of scientific material to support what you want to have your instructor understand. So, you know, it, you know, I would approach it obviously in a very politically correct way and say, let me tell you a little bit about what I went through and the problems I'm having. And, you know, I'm learning just like a lot of other people are learning now that it can affect brain functions. And there's this really interesting body of literature out there. I don't know if you're interested in looking at any of it, but I'd be more than happy to share it with you. And th that would be a good starting point. You know, I mean, the, I think the thing you don't want to do is, I got memory problems and I need accommodations. <laughs> you know, the other thing is this, if you struggle in school, because of those problems, you need an advocate sometimes. And that's where perhaps your neuropsychologist can be your advocate. So I see patients that are in school where we'll do evaluations, and if there's cognitive problems, um, you know, we write letters to support a, a, a academic accommodations, and they don't get refused because it's a diagnosed medical problem in a medical report. So you can always get yourself an advocate if you're running into those problems. I just wanted to let you know that you had asked about suggestions for people, what they use. Yeah. I could never remember my um, allergies that I had. So one of the, I think it was actually a nurse that told me, because they were A, B, C, E, and V, and to do the alphabet to try and remember, you know, the A, mm -hmm. augment, and B, by and Yep. So... Yeah, that's a, a great example of mnemonics. Um, and again, there, uh, that would be a lecture in its own. But there are books based on how to improve your memory using mnemonics. And, um, you know, like remembering the colors of the rainbow, Roy G. Biv. You know, I mean, there's a whole bunch of really interesting strategies you can uh, employ. And you know what? They're really helpful if you're in school and you have to memorize lists of things. And there's so many cool things that can help, again, when you're in those textbooks and, and you've got to learn that stuff. What vitamins do you recommend that people take? Flintstone vitamins? <laughs> uh, no, in all seriousness. Um, so, um, you know, I, I don't. And the reason being is I, I don't prescribe medications. I'm a, I'm a PhD. Um, so, um, you know, usually when people start asking me about medications and things like that, I usually say that's a great conversation to have with your doctor. Um, it's out of my pay grade to, not, not vitamins, but medications and things like that. But, um, you know, I guess I'll try to answer this question with a serious response, and that is um, in some rare circumstances, you can actually have certain deficiencies uh, like B12 and thiamine and other things like that, that if severely enough deficient can cause really significant cognitive problems. Um, so, you know, um, going back to talk to your physician first if you have cognitive concerns. That's where lab work and things like that can hopefully rule those out. But I mean, you know, if you're eating a healthy diet and you're being nutritionally healthy, I think there were lectures here at this conference about nutrition and things like that. You know, do you need vitamins or not? I, I, I don't know. I mean, again, I think, I think that's a, a conversation you have with your doctor about that. Questions. One is, I transplanted last May, so I'm coming up on a year. So I've heard that you can use the chemo brain excuse for a year. <laughs> and, um, I have you get the, like, the one-year card? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. So I'm wondering, you know, what happens after the year, and yeah. then is that true or is that what they appease you with? But yeah. the other part of that question is, I just came off ProGraph a couple of weeks ago, and I, I have some fatigue issues that 
kind of cloud with chemo brain. I don't know oh, if yeah. you guys have That's very typical. Yep, yep. Um, nothing is anything to yep. complain about. Mm -hmm. But um, So my question is, does the is that fog associated with the prograph at all? And am I seeing mm -hmm. that kind of lifting because I'm not on prograph? Or is it? Just because another month has gone by. Yeah, so your first question is is, is, is there this magic thing that after a year you're supposed to be all better? I think the answer to that is no in some people. You know, where that one-year mark is, I think we use that for everything from strokes to head injuries to whatever. Uh, but in the chemo literature, again, you know, there's some studies that have looked at by one year rates of improvement, and there's some reports that the vast majority, at least in certain cancer populations, show nice improvement by a year. But look, I have patients where it persists, and then the job, the tough part is trying to figure out why, you know. Um, I don't think we know enough about chemo brain and its mechanisms to say it absolutely can't be chemo. But at the same time, remember that long list that I had with other things that could be contributing? Those are things that we really have to also consider. Are they somehow maintaining the cognitive symptoms in some way? And should we be addressing any of those factors? You brought up fatigue, and that's usually or is one of the big culprits that can kind of maintain that cognitive presentation for a while um, and cause problems with attention and speeded thinking and memory. So um, I think fatigue goes hand in hand a lot of the times with chemotherapy and cancer and it's one of those things that obviously you know we try to work with and as far as how we address that it's everything from making sure there's not a medical reason for it that needs to be corrected, uh, exercise, um, you know again healthy nutrition, time, you know just giving it some time, uh, things like that. I mean your body basically deconditions when you go through chemo and you got to rebuild it up, you know. Uh, as far as the prograph, I don't know. Um, you know, I, I don't know of literature on prograph and its specific effects on cognition. I wonder about your fatigue again and how much that's playing a role. Okay. So just really quick, I'm a five-year transplant survivor, and I want to address you. <laughs> You know you can't get away from the clock. Girl, it's been five years. You use that cancer card as much as you want. You've earned it. You've earned it. I cannot stress that enough. Um, but just in regards to cancer patients, how, um, how are we moving the education on this forward? Like, why does it seem to be such a struggle to prove this or to make this an actual thing? And is there... Are they coming up with a, maybe a more professional name than chemo brain? Yeah. <laughs> uh, wonderful question. So, um, yeah, I, I think initially uh, some of the resistance came from physicians, just not knowing it and accepting it. You know, I mean, well, you should be fine. We don't know why you're having these problems. It's all in your head, you know, that kind of stuff. I think now some of the, the, the issues is, again, that, you know, chemotherapy, um, it's a heterogeneous group we're studying. I mean, there's many different types of cancers. There's many different types of chemotherapy agents out there. It's difficult to study this, you know. And, you know, there's a lot more that we don't know than what we do know, you know. Um, and when you can't I start identifying underlying causal mechanisms, I think it, it's harder to kind of really put it out there as, you know, we know what this is. This is what it is, you know. But, what, you know, so that was part of your first question. You said, what can you do? You know, I think, again, it, it comes down to having conversations with physicians and education and things like that. Um, the second question you asked was about... Yeah. So there was, a, there was an article not too long ago in one of my neuropsychology journals where they're kind of um, coming up with an alternate name for it. And... Um, it was something more like cancer brain something than chemo brain, which has gotten, you know, again, has some mixed kind of views on out there. I don't know if that'll ever, you know, get any traction. But um, I, look, I'm a believer that, or I, I do believe that, you know, a lot of people are researching this. A lot of really good people are researching this. We're, there's actually data uh, being collected or has been collected. I've been part of some of these studies where we're doing some very advanced brain imaging and we're showing, you know, correlates on our imaging with the cognitive symptoms, which really helps kind of validate this as a concept. You know, we're, we do structural imaging and some studies have shown changes in the size of certain brain parts, you know, after chemotherapy. There's functional imaging where you can actually look at how the brain is functioning inside the scanner. Um, and there's some studies, looking, again, using that technology, and there's other types of imaging stuff going on right now. So I think, you know, again, with time, with good research, you know, this is going to become more commonly accepted. This is going to be a hard question, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you indicated that you've done a fair number of studies on people who are recipients of chemo and looking at their 
mechanical and, and processing skills. Have you done any studies of caregivers? Hmm. And how, you know, when you're participating in this exercise for months at a time, the caregivers' skill sets change also. Yeah, yeah. Great question. So um, I, I don't want to take credit for uh, a lot of things that I'm not doing. So I've done some research in, in, with systemic cancers. I mean, my primary research interest is with brain tumors and radiation effects on the brain, but I've been involved in some chemo trials. So uh, to answer your question, uh, I'm not doing that research, but there is research on this. I mean, in, in, in a variety of neurologic populations like ALS and Alzheimer's and things like that, there's an incredible amount of like caregiver stress that can affect the caregiver's cognitive skill sets and things like that. So there is work being done on that. I'm not part of that, um, but yeah, it's, it's a very important part of it. I mean, you're a team, <laughs> you know, and you both want to be doing the best you can, you know, um, so there is some work doing uh, not. Now, the, the other the thing, I don't know of any, I haven't seen any studies that have specifically looked at caregivers' cognitive functions. It's more about quality of life, mood, stress. That would be a really cool study if it's not being done. There's a dramatic change in your life activities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, th I think, uh, you know, a number of hypotheses from, you know, uh, disturbance in sleep of the caregiver, whether it be because of sleeping in hospital chairs or stress, you know, mood changes, the stress can definitely affect brain uh, physiology and, and, and chemicals. So, you know, I, I think it would be interesting if it's not being done uh, you know, to do a study like that. Uh, me again. Uh, one is this uh, mood change when you find out you've had cancer. I mean, it was just dramatic oh, with yeah. me. I'm a type A personality driving the left lane, and I just moved to the right lane and moped along. And yeah. Then that, a few years later, I'm back in the left lane and having yeah. red Z4 now. Sure. But the, the, the impression is just so overwhelming when you're diagnosed with cancer. Absolutely. This can really affect it. Yeah, and that's another thing that um, unfortunately gets overlooked a lot of the time. You know, you, there's so much focus on what are we going to do medication-wise? What are chemos that we're going to do? What are we going to do for the cancer? And that's important, but we can't forget the patient, you know, and their reaction to their situation and, uh, you know, their emotional well-being. And, you know, I think a good cancer site is truly a multidisciplinary site where it's not just your oncologist, but they have, again, psychologists or counselors that can work on that part. You have the nutritionist that can work on that part. You know, again, a true multidisciplinary approach to conceptualizing and treating the patient. Um, uh, because, you know, I'll have patients, for example, that, you know, it wasn't even brought up. I mean, you know, they're struggling with depression or anxiety, even crippling anxiety. I had a patient recently who, you know, worked in the medical field. She couldn't even go back to work, you know, because she was so worried about cancer recurrence and, you know, all of these things. And nobody brought that up, you know. Uh, so we finally got her in treatment, uh, and hopefully she's going to do a lot better with that. But you're absolutely right. I mean, you just get blindsided by that, you know. Is there a relationship between having received chemo and a higher incidence of dementia and or Alzheimer's? I get asked that all the time. <laughs> and there is no data that I'm aware of that's shown that link, but I get asked all the time. Um, you know, and, and the reason why it makes me, I, 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 don't, I don't believe that there's a link, you know, partly because there hasn't been anything shown. But, you know, there is some literature, for example, that if you have a severe traumatic brain injury early in life, that does increase your risk a little bit for developing dementia. So you've got to wonder, like, early neurologic insults or, or things that can take away some of what we call your cognitive reserve, does that potentially increase the likelihood? You know, with chemo, again, there's no data at all to support that. So I always tell my patients, I don't think you need to worry about that. You know, we just don't, you know, hasn't been shown. But it's a very interesting question. Yeah. Yes? You know, I would just like to say that she was at Mayo, and the nurses up there said chemo brain is real. I didn't go through it. She did. So I don't need a doctor to tell me this. Look, I'm telling you, it's real. It affects you. And if somebody doesn't like it or believe it, the hell with them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
Now, um, the, the other thing, too, and it's a balancing act. Uh, you know, obviously, this is a selection bias who's in this audience. You came to this talk because maybe you have symptoms or, you know, uh, concerns about it. But I also am very careful to tell my patients that many patients go through cancer treatments without developing cognitive problems in chemo brain. So the one thing I don't want to do is scare the bejesus out of these people before they go through their treatments. You know, What I want to do is educate them. I want them to know it's a possibility. And if you experience it, don't freak out. You know, There's good data showing you get better. You know, And if you experience it, you're not going to go years without us doing something about it. You know? So you know, again, clinically, I, you know, it, it, we don't want to over-pathologize it. But at the same time, we need to recognize that it does affect you know, a, a fair amount of patients. So, but thank you for your statement. Thank you. Hi, right. I'm Bill. I'm a three and a half year transplant survivor. Thank you. Uh, my chemo brain actually didn't affect me until about eight months after I permanently got home. And I started doing more things, and then it was like, oh man, I, you know, I'm, I'm forgetting dates. And my daughter was, said that oh, tomorrow I'm not going to come home from school, and, I, and it, just, it was gone. But as you were saying, and there's hope for people out there that you know, are really struggling with this is that it does get better. Mm -hmm. Now, with me, it, it has gotten better, but it's not totally gone. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, maybe my question is, that I probably maybe answered this already, but how long? I mean, do I, you know, down the road, does it mean do I have to go another five years, ten years down, or, or, is, it, or is it basically it kind of plateaus at a certain level? We don't know. <laughs> No, uh, you know, look, uh, I should just have a sign that comes up for that. Uh, and, um, look, the way I look at it is this, is that, I mean, it, there's a lot of variability in kind of how long it takes people to recover. And then I'll have some patients that, you know, are, are very resistant to that recovery process, that natural recovery process. But here's the bottom line. Don't be passive about it. Do something about it, you know? I mean, we talked about, and I know I quickly went through some of these, you know, behavioral strategies, and some of you might be skeptical saying, well, I do some of this stuff, I do some of this stuff, and I still have these problems. But, you know, again, when you really dive into this stuff and you start taking control of your environment and, and, and you make it part of your, the way you live your life, you know, you can really minimize those symptoms if you're just not going to get that natural recovery on your own, you know? So, you know, uh, no, I mean, I, I think there's hope, <laughs> you know, for sure. Thank you. Yeah. We got time for one more, one more question out there? In the back. Um, I just wanted to interject more. I'm 25 years post-transplant. <laughs> the chemo brain thing is real, but I, I'm noticing more, and I don't know if it's just because it's long-term or I'm getting older, that it's been worse. Yeah. But, but like, it's, I think it's up and down. Yeah. I think it's like so, a roller coaster. So, you know, you bring up two good points. I mean, one of the things you bring up is, like, good days, bad days, variability, that kind of stuff, right? And I get asked that a lot. Like, you know, what explains that? Is that, is that something you want me to speak to, or? Yeah, sure. Yeah, okay. All right. Sure. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, I think that we have to think of the, the brain is, um, it's very complex and it, and, and it doesn't take much to uh, affect the way we think either in a positive or negative direction. I mean, just think again about your own lives. After a bad night of sleep, what does that do to your thinking the next day? Or if you're under a lot of stress, you know, what does that do to your thinking? And there's a whole list of things. So, you know, I think sometimes what happens, what explains that variability is, is that there might be some core underlying issue that just gets magnified depending on some of these other external variables. So I like to spend some time with my patients talking about, well, what makes for a bad day? And if you don't know, let's start thinking about that and journaling about that and, and figure out what some of those issues are that can make for a bad day. Because, you know, with the brain, if you got a, a let's say, a problem, it's, it's, it should be consistent, you know. So there might be some fluctuations in severity depending on, you know, everything else the brain has to process or, or external things on the brain. Chemo brain doesn't get worse over time um, from a coarse point of view. And if you're noticing symptoms getting worse, that's something we want to look at. You know, uh, that would not be the expected course. The expected, you know, course of chemo brain is, is it starts during or shortly after chemo. Y your situation, I hear all the time, eight months later, but it's because you weren't really working your brain that hard probably until you got back to work or whatever you're doing. So, you know, again, it starts with chemotherapy and, you know, it gets better in most individuals. We don't expect worsening over time. And if that's happening, you know, we want to, again, look into other things perhaps. 
Very good. Thank you, David. That yep. was excellent. Thanks. If there's any other questions, I'll stick around for a few minutes.